my name is Johanna Pung. I'm working at Northern Institute and the College of Indigenous Futures, Arts and Society at Charles Darwin University here in Australia. For my presentation today is going to be discussing a couple of my um, findings from my PhD that I finished this year, earlier this year, focused on um, open educational practice with Northern Australian Indigenous workforce development, uh, connecting culture and knowledge communities. Before I begin, I want to tell owners of the land on which we are working and meeting today. I am on Larrakia country here. Beautiful saltwater country at the top end of uh, the Northern Territory in Australia. I want to extend my special respect to elders past, present, and future, and acknowledge the authority of Indigenous people who are joining us today and the authorities in the land on which you're joining us from. Just a bit of context where I am. Northern Territory in Australia is this section here. We have a life expectancy lower than uh, many regions of the world and the rest of Australia. Puts us on par with some of the um, more uh, impoverished nations and states around uh, the, the world. We have a population of 250,000 people and uh, that's just under one and a half million square kilometers here in the Territory. 30% of those people are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, or ATSI, as the acronym is. And 30% of the people that live in the territory were born overseas. Australia has a remoteness score uh, that goes from 0 to 50. And most of the cities on the eastern seaboard here are a 2 or a, a, a 3 on that scale. Whereas up in the territory here, we're up at the top around 12, 13, 14, depending on um, where in the territory you are. 30% of our, our households have no Wi-Fi, mobile signal, intranet, or even a landline. Many of the remote communities in the territory have a payphone, one payphone in the center of the community. Uh, employment participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, population in the territory is 37%. And um, we have a legacy of some pretty interesting policies regarding um, respecting people's rights to self-determination. We wanted to look up the Northern Territory Emergency Response and, and boarding schools for students across the territory uh, as early as the middle school years, um, as well as the economic um, aspects of living in a highly uh, transient population, um, as well as reliant on extractive um, and industry um, sector and um, big expensive infrastructure projects that come and go. We've got a very particular uh, and very unique culture and democracy and uh, policy landscape that we're working in when it comes to um, understanding the impacts of how workforce development and indigenous populations here might be affected. So in my PhD, I studied and developed and was a part of these four main projects. This is called Jurwir, uh, and it's a page on the Bowerbird platform, which is a citizen science website, which my supervisor, Kathy Fizajaka, and I populated with biodiversity sightings from our homeland in traditional language and knowledge. Pre-VET is a free vocational education uh, training set of digital magazines uh, showcasing uh, role models in different um, vocational job pathways and talking about the kinds of literacy and numeracy they needed on the job. The Indigenous Fisheries Training Framework was a larger kind of set of practices and um, bundled and unbundled skill sets to help support people do business, uh, fisheries business and aquaculture businesses on their on their country um, and kind of mainstream traditional um, livelihoods and involved a lots of videos um, that 
staff members in these communities made themselves. Um, and this is an indigenous engagement model made uh, as part of an international project for biosecurity with New Zealand and Indonesia as well. This is the Australian version, and this is a way to um, instruct government if employed scientists to engage with traditional owners on their country and open the conversation up a little bit to them. So the way I analyze these is that the very particular cultural context that we're in is that majority of a lot of uh, institutional-led education and policy programs don't always acknowledge how learning is done in uh, especially in Indigenous communities. Um, there's an assumption that they need to kind of come to the mountain, so to speak. Um, so my question was, who are these resources and practices actually open to you? How do we make open education functionally successful for use with diverse sets of learners, such as this very significant population that we're working with? What is open about these resources and practices, really? I mean... How can we think about openness when it comes to different cultural understandings of what learning means and how it's done? So I went and I looked into um, a bunch of the resources. I went them, I put them through a big evaluation process that you are welcome to look at my GoGN presentation on my PhD in more detail. Um, it's just a lot of <laughs> a lot of steps that I won't uh, belabor today. Um, but I also tried to find the best practice uh, and the successful outcomes and um, how that was defined in a number of ways and how that contributed to an understanding of openness for use in these. I found these three principles to come out of the evaluation. And I want you to just think about this. This was going to be my Mentimeter interactive poll, but because of the place I'm in, we had a huge power outage today. Um, and I got a taste of what digital and uh, power poverty is like just for four hours. Um, so I'm very much living the, the, the remote life at the moment. Um, so I thankfully had an asynchronous option to record and upload this uh, for you guys um, today. So I'll do this this evening, hopefully, if my, if my bandwidth can handle it. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to uh, invite participants in my presentation to do is kind of consider these two questions about which of the principles from uh, my findings you would use in your own settings. What communities or learning settings does it make you think of and how can you see them being facilitating um, international um, inter and national cultural and knowledge cooperation? So I found that language use develops consent and dialogue. So not just the spoken languages, but um, the ways we establish understanding and meaning across different knowledge systems. We kind of take for granted that we un understand what open might mean in, in certain communities, um, such as our own uh, open education. But um, I've had lots of rich debate with people about um, open being a copyright definition or a technical thing, but I'm kind of looking at openness as a cultural aspect and how it's expressed. So the ways that we understand and use language when we're learning with other people, um, how we can appropriate platforms with authorship from the learners, which I'll show you in a minute, and represent their narratives. A situated praxis was another thing that I found to be really important. Um, practicing uh, and positioned and placed knowledge um, in context really recentered the learners and their meaning for their learning, um, the local knowledge and sovereignty thereof, to maintain the primacy of country-based knowledge, to keep knowledge on country. Um, and you'll see an example of that as well. And also the, fine, the final um, principle I found was uh, this kind of transformative idea of the digital sphere being a cultural interface. And if claimed by authors of their own learning, we can come transcend this kind of content delivery idea of, of um, open and online and digital learning into um, authorship and authority and, 
and learners can actually practice their knowledge authority, which is a, a big term here in um, cultural uh, knowledge discussions. So that would distinguish content from processes and learning through processes, promote traditional knowledge authors to use tools to retain knowledge sovereignty and learners authority. So really claiming some digital territory and appropriating it for the learners that have tens and tens of thousands of years of worth of knowledge uh, and practice. So one example of the first principle is language use. So the pre-med magazines I mentioned before, this is the vocational pathways. They open up a new dialogue about workforce participation in territories. So they change the discussion around indigenous employment just by featuring and privileging indigenous role models as experts in their own field. Many of the students in such a smally, uh, small and sparsely populated um, part of Australia recognized a lot of these people as their cousins. And so it was actually pretty cool for and motivating for a lot of students in the middle school um, and, and higher, even older students that were accessing these resources to see um, authorities on employment um, talking about living in those two worlds. Jurawir, this is my wonderful Nandi or mother, Kathy Kuzajaka. She was one of my supervisors as well. She um, used her understanding understanding um, a deep knowledge of traditional um, language of seasons. So in, in, in Northern Australia, especially in Central Australia, all over Australia, we have seasonal calendars. Here in the Territory, we have um, up to seven seasons that have been identified by different cultural groups. So it's more than just winter, summer, dry, wet. Um, we have, yeah, seven different seasons. So it gives a bit of a nuance to seasonal understanding and understanding the elements, which of course may have been responsible for, <laughs> for the big power outage today again. So very much a life, uh, part of our lives every day. Um, so Lutta used um, a lot of indigenous common names and language, Oops, pardon me, covering it up down there. Um, and Durudur is uh, the season in December, and she noted that this particular um, species was used uh, for certain things. This is a paper bark um, tree. But then she talks about usage in indigenous culture. So she kind of claims that on base with language. And the fishery resources, this is an oyster farm out in, uh, out in an island community. Um, and this was a, was a, a um, a video that was authored and narrated in language by a bunch of people that are growing beautiful oysters out on their out on their sea country. So they were using a lot of their own language and we used English subtitles there as well. And the um, Plant Biosecurity Cooperative Research Center project as well, um, that adjusted the timing in terms of the conversation that always needs to have. And you can see there's a lot of different times to stop and think and prepare and reflect. So really using language in a very um, nuanced and um, very clever way, a lot of these resources. Situated praxis, this is wonderful. So context embedded learning. Um, this is a, a kangaroo tail being cut up and getting ready for the fire. This is a part of the tour guide resource. So that really is something that was very common and, and understood as a, a that, that's a real thing that happens in everyone's families. Um, in, in kind of the southern part of the Northern Territory, um, out towards the desert more, um, where people, there's a lot more kangaroos. And so this is a common thing to eat. Um, and so this is really embedded in the, in the local context of learning. So having students recognize this rather than um, something that's very um, city oriented was um, actually really helpful to situate their learning with them. Julia, um also, the um, the boxes had um, a number of different fields that you could kind of fill out. But they were very prescriptive in that way. So um, the way they used it, she appropriated um, a lot of the boxes and she didn't fill out boxes for traditional information um, or, or stories um, that she didn't have the authority to speak of, but um, 
she also appropriated a lot with the, in the next example I'll show you. The FRDC project used a lot of um, making and creating this knowledge and, and reclaiming a lot of digital territory again with situating their knowledge here on country. And this is where we do our work. And um, there's a lot of in-depth cultural um, governance associated with who can work on what country as well. Um, and the plant biosecurity also situated the dialogue, resituated the dialogue between stakeholders. And there are some beautiful videos um, in, a, in association with the, the resource to talk about um, ways of doing things um, and put the featured in that as well. She's a bit of a, of a star. So final principle is uh, transcending the cultural interface. So this is my Yapa, this is Lisa Jaka's daughter, and she is the Aboriginal police, uh, community police officer in Galloway-Gold. Um, she's quite a key feature in a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of roles in society, uh, both Yomo and um, uh, territory um, levels of governance. So she really spoke to the camera and we got a lot of the, of the role models to author what they wanted to say in each of the videos and um, featured of job pathways. So there was a way that the actual role models really just spoke through the screen to students because they knew who they were talking to. They knew who the audience was going to be. Lutha also um, kind of appropriated the, the taxonomy area for whether or not the species belong to the Hiracha or Dua clan. Um, and that is a key feature of organizing the world and the ontology in the Yomo um, world is understanding clan membership of plants and animals as well as people too, um, and parts of the country. Um, this flipping the terms of the relationship and the discussion between uh, compliance to partnership was what a big job for the engagement model and how that kind of opened things up. And the choice of resources for the videos, the fisheries uh, videos, participants who made the videos did not choose an entirely open license. Um, and I you know, discussed all the options with them as well, that a lot of the, the knowledge that they created has already um, been culturally appropriated in lots of different ways. And so I think, you know, when we understand the definitions of open as purely um, licensed, it's driven and not um, in context of how knowledge in that community has been dealt with prior to this. I think that understanding the appropriateness of certain kinds of level, um, and you may be thinking about traditional knowledge badges that came from uh, cultural context. So again, which principle would you use and how? Would you think about language use and how um, how that kind of nuanced language use and appropriating and flipping of the terms of conversation, establishing consent and authorship and narratives effectively and with negotiation and um, with time. How does that make you think of a learning situation that you might use these in? Situated in context um, embedded sources and processes to recenter your learners. How does lo local knowledge and knowledge sovereignty of those communities help to maintain the primacy of that local knowledge and the, the contextualized knowledge that comes and stays in a place and is significant to a place? Um, what makes you think, what, what communities or learners does that make you think of? And finally, transcending the digital sphere and the cultural interface. When you think of the stuff that happens in the ecosphere when we do remote learning and digitally enhanced learning and open practices, especially this year, what happens between you and the, the learning design and the resource that you're using and the people that use it on the other side of the screen? How and what happens in that space to transcend the relationship from passive delivery and um, um, acceptance to authority and authorship of learning and participation and partnership where people can practice knowledge sovereignty and learner authority over their own learning and manage their knowledge with traditional with respect to their traditional conventions. How can 
we distinguish just content and engagement in content um, from the processes that are significant, not just to us, but to the learners as well. So I would love to have your thoughts if you have uh, the time and mental mental bandwidth to uh, to engage with me on this. Um, I'm once again so sorry about the power. I would love to have met everybody in, in the session today, um, but that's life in remote parts of the world. Thank you very much. You're welcome to email me or hit me up on tw uh, Twitter, um, and I'll be posting this in my session um, record today. Thank you very much.